All right, what do we know about databases? If the users can find a way to mess them up, they will mess them up. Well, let's file that one in the back of our heads. All right? And I'll tell you why uh, we'll file that one in the back of our heads. Uh, because, number one, that's probably a true statement, not just in the IT world and not just about users, but that's probably a true statement simply about humanity in any situation. <laughs> All right? I mean, you could apply that to the Browns in a football game. You can apply that to almost anything. And let's file that away because one of our jobs as designing databases is to make them, um, is to do our best to ensure the integrity of the data. All right? Which means that, um, obviously, you can't do anything to ensure 100% accuracy. There's always going to be the room for human error. But there's certain kind of errors that we can actually prevent through a proper database design. So, we might not be able to fix all the errors or catch all the errors, but some we can. So, let's keep that in the back of our mind, that that, that is... Uh, that, that that's actually that's actually an interesting place to start. I wouldn't have thought to start there, but it, it is uh, it is a positive from the respect that that sort of mentality is going to inform uh, our database design. We're going to do what we can to make it so uh, we can eliminate the errors that we can possibly eliminate. All right. So let's put that in the back of our mind because I do want to come back to that at a, at some point. Uh, in in the lecture. I'm not sure what point, but prevent the errors we can prevent. You know, you can't design a database that, like, if someone types their first name as Mark instead of Mike, that the database flashes up an error and says, hey, wait a minute, you're not Mark, you're Mike, right? <laughs> yeah, we, really. we can't do that. But there are some errors that we can prevent. All right. What's something else that we know about databases? How would you define a database? A collection of related data. Oh, really good. Collection of related data. Yeah, that counts. A collection of related data. Um, in general conversation, people use the words data and information like interchangeably. You know, do you have your information? Do you have your data? But in IT, people typically use data and information as meaning different things. All right. How would you define data as opposed to information? What's the difference between data as opposed to information? Yes. You use data to come up with information? Yeah. Data. Yeah. From data. You derive information. And what's the difference between data and information? And what what um, what is a, what? So okay, th that's a true statement. But what's the difference that between data and information? Yes. Information is something that can be used by. Yeah. Uh, information is something that can be used. Uh, sometimes they use a word, and I hate when people like make up these new sounding words. I mean, I guess it happens all the time. But the word that I've heard is actionable. I know you can take action on it. You can do something with it. Right. So, for example, um, if you said, if you had a company and their sales was for the month of September, if their sales was Four hundred thousand dollars. What does that mean? Is that good or bad? Yes. We don't know because we don't have the rest of the data. We don't know because we don't have more data to put that in the context. So, if it was a very small company, 
And in, what I say, for September they sold 400,000. If in uh, August they sold 300,000, in July they sold 200,000, in June they sold 100,000, and so on, would say, yeah, things are looking good. They're making pretty good advances every month. So yeah, things are probably going pretty good for them. If on the other hand, it was say Microsoft or General Motors, and they only sold $400,000 worth of stuff in a month, ooh boy, something's bad. All right. Very bad. Uh, and something would have to be done with it. So, how do you turn data into information? What's, what's that process? What are some of the things that you do to turn data into, into information? You can graph it. Pardon me? You can graph it. You can graph it. Yeah, you can graph it. All right. That's true. In other words, you can visually present it. Sometimes that's useful. That's true. What else? Compare it to other data. Compare it to other data. In the case of our sales, in the case of our sales example, we compared it to previous month sales. So we can look at historical data. The other thing that we could do is compare it with related data. So for example, if we sold $400,000 worth of stuff, but our expenses were $3 million, well then we're probably still not doing very good, right? If we compare our revenue with our expenses, then we're not doing very good. If on the other hand, we sold $400,000 of stuff and our total expenses for the month was $2, hundred thousand dollars then okay yeah we, we probably are doing a little bit better so we can compare data uh, to other data what's other ways that we can do it um, you mentioned graphing so doing it visually um, I would say with graphing what typically happens is you're going to be consolidating or summarizing data would be another way that you can transform data into information. All right. So you can compare it to other data, and you can summarize it, would be uh, another way. For example, if I looked at a single order for that month, that wouldn't necessarily tell me anything. Even if I looked at a list of all the orders, I probably want to summarize them. I don't care about every individual. If I'm, if I'm, let's say, the manager of this company or the, the CEO, I don't necessarily care about every single order. I just want to see, you know, totals. So summarize the data. Take each order and tally it up and see what the totals are. So that's another way that we can do that. Um, we can compare to other data, historical data, related data. Related data could be inside or outside the company, right? We could, we, could, we could have lost money last month, but our competitors lost more money, all right? So it might actually be a good month because, let's say, the economy goes bad and businesses are, are, uh, you know, are having difficulties. If we're having less difficulty than our competitors, then we're doing pretty good, all things considered. All right, so comparing, summarizing, um, I was trying to think there's some other ones. Um, one thing that can be done is looking for exceptions. All right, that's another way that you can gather information. Um, in my example of, of four, uh, $400,000 worth of sales, we might look for uh, companies who, or we might look for divisions within our company who uh, either sold a lot more than they did last month or sold a lot less than last month. Because even though the company might be overall doing fine, there might be divisions that are having difficulty. So we might look to see, break it down by a division basis. So by summarizing, maybe another way to say it is organizing. <coughs> Um, 
we can derive and we can take this raw data and turn it into information. So, the lesson to be learned for this, for us people in IT, is flexibility. The more flexibility we have in taking our raw data and turning it into information, the better off we're going to be. All right? So if we can only get a report a certain way, then that report might be useful, but that report won't give us necessarily a complete picture of the organization. Right. Whereas if we have a lot of flexibility in the way that we can take our data and transform it into information, we have the ability to see things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. So a key thing for this is flexibility. All right? What's another key? to this process going well that relates to this up here. That's the accuracy of the data. Probably the oldest acronym in information technology is garbage in, garbage out. Right? If the data is bad, the information it comes from, it can't be good. No. All right? So therefore, you will take steps in developing system to make sure that the data is accurate and make sure that you can present the data in a flexible manner. All right? These two things taken together are really the reasons why we have databases and relational databases. All right? Because relational databases allow for both of these things. Let's explore for a minute how it allows us to get both of these things. Would you describe a list, a, a set of Excel worksheets as being a database? People are shaking their heads no. Probably not. You can do some great things with Excel, but probably not. Yeah. Why would you not consider that a database? Well, it may, might take forever to update. Why would, why would you say it would take forever to update? It's not a database, it's easier to update, it's just faster and quicker and more efficient. Okay, that is, that is probably true. Um, with, depending on how your uh, spreadsheets are organized, it's possible you might have to update in a couple different places, all right? Maybe you have one spreadsheet that shows this, one spreadsheet that shows that, and they might show duplicated data, which means that if something changes, you have to update several places. Well, that's going to take more time. In addition, there's a risk of accuracy and inconsistency because you might make a mistake updating one of it. Um, we talk about putting our code all in one place so that we can make a change in one place and it will be reflected. Guess what? It's the same thing with databases. We want, all, we want every individual fact, every individual piece of data to be stored in one place and one place only so that if you update it, all you need to do is update in one place. If you imagine having several different um, spreadsheets that have customer information, might have the customer name, address, and phone number on them. If, you had to ch if the customer changed their address, you'd have to go and update each spreadsheet individually. Whereas with the database, you wouldn't have to. All right? Another reason why you would not consider the Excel sheets a database Yes? The different sheets can't communicate with each other, like if you have calculated. Yeah. The different sheets can't really communicate with each other. And again, you can do crazy things in Excel. Let's forget about that. All right? Because, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, let's just forget about that possibility. Another way of saying that is the data in them isn't related. So if you have something that's common in a bunch of, spreadsheets, you can't change it in one place and have the effect ripple. You can't easily do that. Um, the process to do that would be uh, very fragile and, and, and likely to contain error. So, we have data and the data is related. Those two things taken together are what give us the flexibility and the accuracy. All right? So data organized in a series of spreadsheets, that's not a database. All right? 
Data stored in a certain format is a database. What is the format that databases are stored in? How can we describe the way that data is stored in a database? What are some of the structures or components of a database? Yes? Okay. So you got to be careful. I think you're, you're trying to answer. A table, right. So first of all, data in a database are stored in tables. I'm going to put up here, too, another thought that I want to keep in our back of our, on my mind. In the database, each piece of data is stored only once. Right? So that's just like our code. That's a goal in our database, just like it is with our code. Um, because, uh, again, yeah, if I move, I shouldn't have to change my phone number in 10 different places, 10 different Excel worksheets. Change it in one place. So the first thing we have is we have a table. A table is all the data about one entity. What do I mean by an entity? I mean people, places, and things, which um, if you remember Schoolhouse Rock, what are pieces, places, and things? Nouns. Okay. So if someone is describing their business to you, and you have to develop a database for it. They may say things like, well, we have these customers. These customers place orders. The orders uh, are for different items that, that we sell. Uh, each item is stored in a warehouse. Um, and so on and so forth. If we were designing a database, we would pluck out the nouns from that statement, and we would likely have four entities. Um, let me see if I can remember them. Customer, uh, orders, items, and warehouses. All right? So probably that's a good place to start. It's not one of those foolproof things, right? Because database design, again, requires your judgment as a database designer. But a lot of times the nouns um, that you get when you look at a business are the... Um, are the, uh, uh, the the tables in a database. What, uh, what about for a school? Let's say we're going to do a database for a school, uh, a college. What are some of the entities that you'd have for? Yes? Students. Students. Courses. Courses. Teachers. Teachers. Grades. Grades, yeah. All right. It's a good good start. Um, there could be sections for the courses, right? Because um, some courses are taught multiple sections. Uh, there are rooms, all right? Um, there are degrees. Um, there are departments. All those things would be um, entities, likely, and would likely be a table uh, in the database. Keep in mind that when you're describing this, you are looking for the relevant entities. And it depends partly on what it is that you want to solve. For example, whiteboards. Whiteboards are a noun, right, that are on campus. Would you have a, a, uh, an entity in your database for a whiteboard? Uh, probably not. Right? Yeah. I mean, you know, probably, there's probably not much you want to do for it. You put the white, you know, when you build the, when you build the uh, uh, room, you have whiteboards, you have electrical outlets, okay, they're there, but it's not like anything that you need to know that there's a whiteboard. Oh, maybe you do, and maybe you do know, need to know other things. For example, uh, if you've ever had a class in BU 105, right down below us, 
there's a big sort of Star Trek council at the, t at the beginning of class for IVDL. So there's IVDL equipment. Well, that might be a, uh, an entity in our database because it's important to know what rooms have IVDL. You can pretty much assume every room is going to have a whiteboard. Right? I don't know if there's a, a, a place on campus that doesn't have some kind of board for the, the teacher to write on. But an IVDL room, well, those are special because not many of them. And what's more, those are very expensive pieces of equipment. So we probably would want to track where those things are. And we might want to, when we're scheduling classes, know which rooms have IVDL so that we know how to schedule that. So you have to decide what's relevant for your problem, what it is you're trying to solve. All right. Ideally, if you design your database well, your database is flexible enough so that um, you can make changes without having the whole thing crush and fall down um, underneath you. So that's sort of the idea of database design. You, if, if you do it in the right way, um, you can expand it without having too many difficulties and you can add some things on. So maybe at first we didn't have IVDL equipment, then we later realized we needed it. Well, if you did a good job designing the initial database, it shouldn't be that hard to, to add on to it. If you did a, didn't do a good job, if you did a poor job designing a database, then it might be difficult to add an extra entity in. I said all data about one entity. What do we call the individual pieces of data about um, an entity? Attributes. Attributes. These actually have a couple different names. Attributes, fields, columns. All right. Sort of depends on what you're talking about. There's sort of a language we use when we're designing and a language we use when we actually put it in the database. Uh, for example, attributes is sort of the design view. Um, uh, uh, columns is typically what we call them when they're actually in the database. So if we add uh, a student table, attributes about a student, student number, first name, last name, middle initial, Um, phone number, email address, and maybe a bunch of other things as well. All right. Now, we can specify we can specify um, rules about each of these attributes. That helps with the data integrity. That helps with the um, with the uh, preventing the errors that we can prevent. So, let's put birth date. On here as well. Keeping in mind that we want to prevent all the errors that we could possibly prevent because if the users can find a way to mess it up, they will mess it up. All right? What are some rules that we could build into our table that would keep people from messing things up? Yes? Properties like a student number can only be entered with numbers. Okay. So we can specify the type of the field. Yeah. So we can say this has to be a number. This is a string. This is a string. This is a string. And what's more, we could put a length on it. Middle initials only going to be one character. These will be whatever we decide on. Phone number, probably a string. Email, probably a string. Birth date's going to be a date. So one thing that we can put on it is we can put on each of these columns or each of these attributes, we can put some properties to these attributes. All right? Some, some characteristics. Now, in database terms, these things are called constraints, right? You think of a constraint, a constraint is a limitation. So we're going to limit people to only putting numbers in the student number field. That way, we prevented the error of someone putting in letters in there. So we know that Fred isn't a, a correct student number. Now, we could still mess up the student number. It could, it could, it, it, it might, it might supposed to be one, two, three, four, and we put in one, two, four, three, but we prevented some of the errors from happening. All right. What's a 
another constraint that we can put on some of these fields. Yes? Uniqueness. Uniqueness. All right. So, what would need to be unique? This would probably need to be unique. First name, no, you could have two people with the same name. Phone number, no, not necessarily. You could have siblings going. Uh, you know, this is sort of a carryover to the old days when people had phones at their house as opposed to personal phones. But we'll say that that, that could be. Email address, probably. I'm probably going to make that unique as well. Only if I'm assigning it, I don't know about that. If two people came in, um, if two people came in and uh, gave the same email address, I think I would complain if I had a system. Well, if they're minors and their legal guardians are taking care of everything, you might want to leave it not unique, just in case it has to go the same legal um, guardian. Maybe. Or maybe I would have another field for uh, guardian uh, email. All right. So that may or may not be unique. Birthday would not be unique. All right, because two people can have the same birthday. Another constraint. Hmm. If it's required or not. Let's see. Does everyone have a student number? Yes. So that will be required. Does everyone have a first name? Yes. Yes. Does everyone have a last name? Well, we could debate that. I'm going to say yes. Yes. Everybody has to have a last name. All right. Does everyone have a bill initial? No. No. Does everyone have a phone? Does everyone have an email? I don't know. All right. Um, I could say no. We could still have the unique constraint on it. And what that would mean is, let's pretend, let's forget about the guardian situation. Let's say we handle that another way. But I could still say it's not required, but it has to be unique. What that means is, is if you supply one, it has to be unique. If you don't supply one, that's okay as well. And birth date, does everyone have one? Sure. So that's another constraint. All right. So I can put these constraints on, and these will make sure that I don't get bogus data in the system. So the required fields you have to put in there. Why do we put these constraints? Because we want to prevent the errors that we can prevent, and that will allow us to have more accurate data. And that means that the data we yield will yield better information. More accurate data yields better information. Indeed. So as the accuracy increases, so does the value of the information. Are there any special columns well, let's, let's back up for a second. Let's say, let's say I have to, we, we talk about related data. How do we relate data to between other entities? For example, if a student, um, took a class and got a grade. How would I link that grade piece of data to the student piece of data? Pardon me? Foreign key. That's a foreign key. Uh, excellent uh, answer. That's exactly right. Uh, what would that entail, though? How would you create a foreign key? I mean, what would the foreign key contain, I guess is my question. Primary key? Would contain the primary key of the other table. Ah. We haven't talked about primary keys yet. What is a primary key? One attribute that you can put into other tables to relate the tables together. Okay. One attribute that you could put in to other 
tables to relate the entities together. Perfect. What are the characteristics of a primary key? Unique. Has to be unique. All right. Hmm. Kind of narrows it down here, too. All right. What's another characteristic of a primary key? Required. It's required. All right. So, in this scenario, there's only one candidate key. All right. What's a candidate key? Well, a candidate key is, is a field that could be the primary key. All right. It has all the characteristics. It's eligible to be the primary key. And what are those? It is uh, unique, and it is required. One thing, just as an aside, that you can have a primary key that consists of a couple parts. We'll talk about those later, in which case it's the combination of the parts that has to be unique. All right? So this is a primary key in this table. That's the way that we identify rows in this table. All right? That's the way everything is going to be linked together in related tables. All right? In order for that to happen, it has to be unique, right? So if we link this to, let's say, a grade table that has the primary key in it, if there are two students that happen to have the same primary key, it would be ambiguous. Who got that grade, right? Who got the A in CISS 243? If there were two people that had the same, uh, same uh, um, student ID, all right? You wouldn't know. Therefore, you absolutely have to make it unique. Also, it has to be required. Um, you can't put a grade in there and not put in a student ID. Or you can't put in a student without a student ID, all right? There has to be something for the student ID so that you could link it, all right? And that will be used to link tables together, all right? Now, let's say our table looks like this, okay? And again, um, we could talk about we could talk about some changes that would allow students to retake a class or something like that, but we won't worry about that right now. Let's say we have a table that contains the student ID and the course ID. Those two together are the primary key. Actually, we'll throw in a semester ID, too. Yeah, that says okay. what semester they took the course. Because a student can't take the same course the same semester. No. All right? You could take a course this semester and next semester. And then there's a grade. These things taken together are the primary key. All right? Students are only going to have one grade for a course in a given semester. They could retake the course later on. They could, for example, gotten an incomplete this semester and retake the course in spring and gotten an A. All right, so um, that would be a possibility. All right. When I define it as a foreign key, what that means is I'm going to link these two tables together by the same student ID. So if I have a student whose student number is student number 100, and that's Charlie, if Charlie took CISS 243, fall of 2017, and got an A, then would have the student ID, the course ID, CISS 243, the semester ID, fall 2017, and the grade. Because these three are unique, I couldn't enter another grade for Charlie, for CISS 243, for fall. I could enter another grade for Charlie for CISS 232 in the fall, or I could enter in another grade for Charlie CISS 243 in spring of 2018. He got an A in the course, but he enjoyed it so much that he took it again. All right. Okay. Um, 
but I could not have this exact entry duplicated. Now, this would be said to be the foreign key in this table, and the foreign key in this table points to a primary key in another table. It has to point to a primary key because we want to make sure that this only relates to one student. This can't relate to more than one student, otherwise, who got that A? All right, we don't know. So it has to point to a primary key in the other table because we have to match it up. This grade relates to this one student. It can't relate to multiple students. All right? Well, so, um, a foreign key. Now, keep in mind, as was stated at the very beginning of class, that if people can mess things up, they will. The constraints for the database, whether they be a primary key constraint, a foreign key constraint, a type constraint, a length constraint, a required constraint, if you define the database correctly, the database enforces those rules for you. All right? That's the big win. You don't have to do anything. The database maintains and manages those rules. So if I create this table in the database, and I say this is a foreign key, there's no way, anyhow, any way, that I could put in two students with the same student ID. I just can't do it. No. The database will not let me do it. Likewise, if I define a foreign key between these two tables, all right, the database will not let me do that. Uh, what, what won't the database let me do? The database won't let me put in uh, a grade for a student that doesn't exist. So let's say uh, the highest student in my database was student number uh, 2000. Uh, there weren't any numbers higher than that. I could not put in a grade for student 3000 then. Because there is no student 3000 in my database. That right? is it. And therefore, I wouldn't be able to put that in. All right? Questions about this? All right. The way we're going to do this database section, and the, this class and probably a couple classes next week will be pretty much talking mainly about database stuff. We're going to talk about database, this is just basic database concepts, and I hope that most of you already knew this and maybe just needed their memory refreshed on this. Um, we're going to talk about uh, database design in more detail, talking about what's called normalization, uh, which is the way that we can, to the, as great a degree possible, prevent the errors that we can prevent by making sure our database is such that each piece of data is only stored in one place. That's all we're doing when we do database normalization. So we're making sure we've designed a database that is as potentially accurate as we can make it. All right? We're also going to talk about SQL, or SQL, which is a language that we use to query, update, insert, delete stuff from databases. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to do this in a couple of steps. All right, we'll go back and forth. I'm going to talk, I guess what you'd call theory, then we'll go and do some practical stuff. And we'll talk theory, we'll do practical stuff. So I don't want to, if I spent all this time, if I just lectured solid theory, well, I'm humble enough to know that I'm not that exciting or I can talk theory for an hour and a half every day and, and everyone's going to be hanging on every single word. You know, we want to see, we want to get hands on. We want to see actually how this works in the real world. So I'll talk a little bit about theory probably at the beginning of each class. And then we'll go into sort of a practical example of this. And we'll talk about practically how to do these things. And then we'll talk practically about um, how this works in ASP.NET. So what I want to do is I want to define a table. All right? And I then want to create a web page that shows the results of that table. All right? 
Now, in doing that, I'm going to have to do a little bit of SQL, so we'll talk a little bit about the SQL that we need, uh, but we'll talk more about SQL going forward. So, let me go and define a table. Does anyone have suggestions about what I should make a table of? Pizza. A table of pizza. Pizza, yeah. Okay, sure. in SQL Server. I do this in Access because a lot of you have already had CISS 143 and Access is pretty sim uh, simple and um, we really want to focus on the ASP.NET piece of this. Um, so therefore we don't, you know, we, we, we uh, want, to, want to make as defining a database as, as easy as possible. So I'm going to create a blank database. All right. When you do that, you get a table. All right? Now, I'm going to right mouse on the table and say go to design view because I want a lot of control over this, um, over this, um, over the creation of, the, of the, uh, this table. So, I'm going to right mouse here and say design view. And I'm going to save this table as toppings. All right, toppings, yeah. All right, so I'm in design view, I'm in design mode. And we have the field name, the data type, and other properties down here. This indicates it's a primary key. By default, Access gives you a field called ID that is the primary key. That's what the little key means. Index, no duplicates, means that you can't have duplicates. The data type is auto number. What does that mean? Whenever you add a new one, it's going to give you incrementally. The Whenever you add a new one, it will give you a, uh, a new one. All right? Um, What if you delete one? What if I add in one, two, and three, and I delete two, and I add the next one? What will it give me? Four. Four. Is that a problem? Maybe. Pardon me? Maybe. 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 Usually not. It would be a problem if it was something like check numbers, where if you're missing a check number, that's a big deal. For here, I'm going to give a topping to e I'm going to give a number to each topping, and. If I'm, if I'm missing two, I'm not going to run out of numbers, all right? So it's not going to be a big deal that I'm missing one of the numbers here. My suggestion is to use auto number keys. Now, numbers are better than alphabetic characters for keys. Why? Well, I said that backwards. I said that like Yoda was asking the question. <laughs> yeah. Why are numbers better than string characters? Four keys. Yes? Because numbers go on infinitely and there's only 26 letters in the alphabet. Numbers go on infinitely and there's only 26, but I could have combinations. I could make like a name that was 10 characters long. That would give me a whole bunch of, of things. <laughs> it's easier to generate numbers than it is. Well, number one, pardon the pun, is that if I let the database do that for me, then that's something else I don't need to worry about. All right? Um, number two, uh, numbers are stored more efficiently in the computer than, than letters are. Uh, it's easier to store a number and it will take up less space. Because keep in mind, when we define something as a key, we're not just having it in the table that we're making it the key of. We're going to use that field everywhere else in the database 
that relates to this table. So we're going to have numbers in other tables as well. All right. So I'm going to make this. The one thing I usually do is I change the name from ID to the name of the table ID. So in my toppings table, I'm going to have toppings ID. All right. And I'm going to have the topping name. I used a reserved word. Okay, name has a special meaning in access, so I cannot use that. All right, so I'm going to say topping name. There's another reason you might not want to use letters instead of numbers. What's that? Uh, especially if you mix them. Um, you, depending on the font, you might mistake an I for a 1 or a 0 for an O. I suppose that's a possibility too, mistaking numbers for digits or lowercase l for one and so on. So that, that's, that's also a possibility. Keep in mind that we're probably not going to see in a lot of cases this primary key. This primary key is going to be behind the scenes. There's two kinds of primary keys in the world. There are what are called natural keys and there are what are called surrogate keys. Natural keys are keys that exist outside the database. For example, your social security number, right? Your social security number means something, right? That's an important number that means something to you. Whereas, if I generate an ID number, that ID number doesn't mean anything outside the database. It's just internally what we're going to use to store information about you. So your student number really doesn't mean anything outside of LC's database. Uh, and is probably generated just one after another. So a key that means something outside the database is called a natural key. You could, for example, use an email address as a key to a table, assuming everyone had an email address and they were all unique. All right? That's a natural key because the email address means something. Whereas an auto number key that's generated really doesn't mean anything. All right. So, sh sh so, short, uh, so I have a, a topping name. Is that going to be required? Yes. I'm going to put a description. I'm going to make it a long text instead of a short text. So I could write a paragraph about the, the description. You know, maybe pepperoni is the topping name. And the, the long description is the marketing term like, old world craftsmen take the best <laughs> pork, beef, and seasonings, and craft custom for your culinary enjoyment. You know, something like that. I could put marketing stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, really. All right? Yeah. Maybe I'll have calories. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I don't want to have calories. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be a number, though. All right? And um, maybe a serving size. And I'm going to skip serving size. I was thinking like how much you put on a pizza, but I guess that would depend on how big the pizza was. So I'll skip that one. All right. So let's say that's my toppings table. All right. I'm going to go ahead and save it. Do I want to save the change? Yes. And now I have this table. Now, for now, we're going to use access to get some values in our table. All right. Um, so I'm going to go double click this. I get the blank toppings name, pepperoni, description, um, our old. I wish I wish I would have typed that in. That was going so good. Our old world craftsman. Take the finest meats and seasonings and craft. What's the what's the the what's like the buzzword that people say? Artisanal and craft artisanal pepperoni. There we go. And calories. I don't know how much calories are in pepperoni. 
we'll say 200. That really doesn't make any sense because 200 for what? For a slice? For the whole pepperoni? I don't know, but just work with me here. Another topping. Uh, pardon me? It's actually 10. 10? Yeah, 10. Okay. <laughs> All right. Our next topping, the controversial one. Pineapple. Pineapple, exactly. Controversy? Not for us. <laughs> for us. We love pineapple on pizza. Actually, I don't. I, mean, I don't hate it, though. I mean, it's still pizza that you're getting, right? So even if there's pineapple on it, it's not horrible. Um, if you don't, don't order it. I know this place that does. Pineapple, ham, red onion, and cinnamon. Tomatoes? Ooh, that's interesting. I I am onion phobic. <laughs> All right. Uh, phobia is a, is a big word there. I, I wouldn't say I'm phobia, but I, I despise onion. I can I, If there's even like a tiny piece on it, I, I it makes me sick. So um, it was. I was with you until you said that. And I'm not sure how I feel about cinnamon on a pizza either. Well, I, I didn't either, but then right. I had it and it was the Right. Worst. Trying to think of the oddest combination I've had. I'm, I'm... I had ground beef on a pizza once in New York. Oh, was it good? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. I'm thinking, it's like, I'm not too picky as far as toppings go, but usually most of the time I get it plain. I just, I just prefer plain pizza. Um, I don't know. All right. Um... Let's see. Um, what is on? What is on the? Um, what is on um, the the real plain pizza? Is that like basil leaves? Anyone have that? Basil. Margaritas. Basil. Yeah, basil. yeah, the margarita pizza. Basil. Okay, basil. Yeah, I do like the margarita pizza. Basil. I'm running out of ideas, so I'll just say yum. Yeah. I don't know, we'll have to put some calories for pizza or pepperoni. I'll also say 10. And basil would, can't be too many calories. So I, I would have said it. Uh, you, at least it looks like you're getting your vegetables. Yeah, at least it looks like you're getting your vegetables. There you go. All right, so we have three of these. All right, let's go make a web page that has this on it. All right, so I'm going to go close out of here. I'm going to make my app. Now this is important. I'm going to put on the desktop. It's making a graph. I don't get it. I'll make an empty website. I'm going to put it on my desktop. And I'm going to call it Pizza. Does it exist? Do I want to create it? Yes. Okay. And I have my application like we've had it before. Now, I created my database. Somewhere. Where did I create the database? Ah, I created it in documents. So I'm going to go find it in documents. I didn't want to create it in documents. Database ACC, so I'll copy it. Put it on the desktop, and I'm going to rename it to Pizza. All right. I want to put it in a special folder within my application. So you want to, you want to catch this. I'm putting it in a special folder. Now, if you remember, when you did Lab 4, I think it was, you created a custom class for 
rock, paper, scissors. You put it in a folder called, well, you, you didn't put it there. Well, you put it there, but it told you where to put it, if, if you remember that. It asked you when you created and saved a custom class, it said, hey, do you want to put it in your app code folder? And if, if you, you probably said yes. You should have said yes. And so it created a special folder for it. There's a special folder for databases as well. And I'm going to Google it because I get this wrong one-third of the time. And I'm not feeling lucky today. It is app underscore data. I would have got it right, but I'm glad I double checked. So I'm going to create an app underscore data folder here. And I'm going to make it uppercase so it stands out. All right. I'm going to copy my database into here. I'm going to go here and click refresh. And now I see my app data folder. All right. I can now look at that database if I want to right within Visual Studio by double clicking it, so on and so forth. All right. So I'm going to create a page. I want this page just to have a list of the toppings that are available. Just a simple list. So I'm going to create a web form. We'll call it default.asp. Select master page. Um, you should say yes because you probably will have a master page. Um, do what I do or do what I say, not what I do. I didn't bother to create a master page for this. Uh, but definitely place code in a separate file as well. I'll click add. And now, I got a form. Now I'm going to do the bit that I talked about last time relating to data binding. All right? What is data binding again? Data binding is where you have a data source and a way that you're going to display it. So you have the actual source where the data lives and how you're going to represent it on your page. All right, those are two separate components. And that's nice because we can change one without changing the other. Um, if we did our menu with the sitemap XML file, we could easily change the menu from being a menu to, from, to being a tree view. All right, all we'd do is change the way that displayed it. We wouldn't have to change the way the data was stored because we're going to bind the data. Same thing here. We could choose to display the data a bunch of different ways. All right? And we can do that without changing the data source. It's still coming from the same place, even if I display it in different ways. So I can change the visual part of it without changing the source of the data. All right? But what I have to do is I have to bind those two together. All right? I have to bind those two together, and that's called data binding. So under data, there's a list of things. I'm going to pick a grid view. A grid view is a simple um, table of things. So I'm going to create a table of toppings. I'm going to create a SQL data source. So I drag that onto my page. And I'm going to click Configure SQL Data Source. Now, this is a step that is important to get right. All right, that's why I showed you deliberately how I went and I created that app code for our app data folder. I drag it in, I hit refresh. If you did everything correct, if you click on this drop down, you see the pizza database. Yeah, I see it. I'm going to click it. Okay. All right. I'll go to next. What do you want to see?
save it as in the uh, application configuration file. I'm going to call it pizza connection string. One application could potentially connect, call it connect to a couple different databases. We have a connection string for each database that we're going to have in our app. There should only be one connection string per database. Why is that? Well, again, same old principle. We have the stuff, the information about how to connect to the database in one place and one place only. So if we change it, we just have to change it in one place. All right. Next. Ah, notice it's showing me the table. All right. For now, since we haven't talked about SQL yet, I'm going to go and I'm going to select the things that I want to display in the, uh, in the grid. So I'm going to pick toppings, ID, toppings name, description, and calories. I want it ordered by topping name. So I want it to be in alphabetical order. All right. And I click OK. I click Next. I can click Test Query. And there we go. There is our table of stuff. And I click Finish. So that's our data source. So we made one piece of this. That's the data source. We're going to bind that then to anything on the page that we want to be populated with that data. This is the same idea that we had when we created the sitemap path, right? And we created the sitemap XML file. We created the sitemap XML file, then we bound our menu to it. We bound our sitemap path. So we got the data to populate those controls from that data source. Uh, in that case, it was an XML file. In this case, it's going to be um, the database. So now, I go in and I say, what is the data source for this? SQL data source 1. All right. And there we go. It shows us the format that we want. Now, when I run this, if I did everything right, we'll get that page. And there we go. There's our data from the database. Cool. Now this is dynamic, right? Which means that if a change happens in the database, it's reflected the next time someone requests that page. So let's go into Access. Oh, I got a new topping. I got a good topping. Mushrooms. Yeah, mushrooms are good on pizza too. Order this if you're a fun guy. <laughs> I crack myself up. <laughs> hey, yeah. I'm going to close out of this because if I don't close out of this, I'm going to get an error because when Access opens it, no one else can use it, right? Because you wouldn't want it to, to, to be changing data uh, while, you know. Uh, so I'm going to close out of this. Good idea. Well, let me show you what happens. If I go and do that, if I hit oops, refresh, it's going to give me an error. Um, I guess it didn't. Oh, I guess it did for once. All right. But notice that mushrooms are now on the list where they belong. So that's what we mean by a dynamic database. I didn't change anything about the page itself. I changed something else. And therefore, that change was immediately reflected the next time someone requested that page. Because remember, the server doesn't have a finished copy of the page. The server has instructions to piece together that page. Yes? Since you chose topping ID, how come it organized everything alphabetically from topping name instead of... Oh, good question. Why did it do that? Because, let me, let me get out of debug.
I'm going to go into configure again. I clicked on order by and say I wanted it order by topic name. I probably did that a little bit fast, but that's why I did it that way. Now, there's one thing I want to check. I want to look at the web config file. Let me try to make this bigger. That's what your, if you look at this, there's an entry. Let me try to make this so that we can see more of it. There's a connection string entry in your web config file that contains the information of how to connect to this database. Again, every database should only have one entry there, right? Because you don't want the same information on how to connect to a certain database several times. Because what if you have to go and change that? What if I change the name of the database or change where it was located or whatever? All right? I wouldn't want to have to change a bunch of places. I would just want to change to one place. But if you notice, there's my name, pizza connection string. And notice where it says data source. It has this vertical line, the word data directory, then another vertical line, then a backslash. That's what you want it to say. If it says something like C colon user mzellers desktop pizza, if it gives the actual physical directory name, you probably set it up wrong. And you want to go back and make it look like this. Make, replace whatever the physical directory is with vertical line, data directory, vertical line, slash. The reason for that is, keep in mind, when you send me your stuff, I don't have your folders on there. I don't have your directories. I don't have your username on there. And therefore, I won't be able to open it if you're pointing to the file in that location because it's going to be at a different location on my machine. Additionally, if you're going to go and put this up on a web, that would involve putting it on another machine. So the folder name on that other machine isn't going to match the folder name on your computer. However, if I say put it in the application's data directory, well, that'll take care of it as long as everything's set up to point to the same data directory, which typically it is. Um, it'll be okay. So, um, if anyone runs into this problem, um, usually what I do is I'll ask to, to review it with them in lab and, and then we'll go and we'll fix it and we'll talk about how to do it correctly. Any questions about this? All right. So, what we're going to do now for a bunch of weeks is talk about more stuff that you can do database-wise in ASP.NET. Again, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the database side, then talk about how to implement that in, uh, in the .NET framework. All right, questions? All right, we'll see you over in lab.